in the Army. What was your highest rank? Second, uh, first lieutenant. And what general locations did you serve? Um, several, many locations in I Corps, the nor northernmost part of South Vietnam. And what, at the start of your service, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was, I, I got my draft notice. Uh, I delayed going in so that I could finish my commitment to teach uh, in a high school until the end of the year. Uh, and I also, uh, at the same time, got a commitment that I would be enabled to go to officer candidate school, whether I made it through or not was on my own. But uh, so that I, I delayed my entry from the draft by enlisting for almost six months and uh, with those two caveats. And uh, tell me about your, when you were officially inducted into the service, what were those first days like? Well, they were quite a shock, actually. Uh, at that time, the cutoff for the draft was age 24. I received my notice eight days before I was 24, so that was somewhat of a shock. I didn't expect it. Uh, I also had a uh, critical skills deferment uh, for teaching high school, but this was uh, right after the, the uh, Tet Offensive, and uh, I guess the need was high enough that they had to reach down and grab me. So uh, I was shocked. Um, I was also, um, I had spent a uh, couple of years out of college. Uh, I wasn't in the best physical shape, so entering into basic training was quite a challenge for me. Uh, the, uh, I, I did basic training in Fort uh, Leonard Wood, Missouri, and uh, mostly it was with 17 and 18 year old Hoosiers, and I was 24, and so they, they immediately called me Pops. But uh, I was lucky because we, uh, we worked together and they helped me get through it, so it was hard though. Do you recall the date that you went to boot camp? Um, it was early October. I don't exactly remember. I, it's in my paperwork when I reported, but I don't remember exactly. It was somewhere probably around the, the 10th or the 12th of October, I would guess. And while you were at boot camp, do you have any uh, memorable experiences while you were there? Uh, many uh, memorable experiences, not necessarily pleasant. Uh, it was very cold and damp in uh, Missouri at that time, just southwest of the cent central part in the hills. Uh, we had not heavy snow, but it was, ra it was rainy and cold. And I was sick a great deal of the time, uh, as were many people, but I had several ear infections and uh, I chose to try and ride them out because I didn't want to get recycled and extend my time. Uh, so uh, it probably caused some damage to my ears by doing that uh, with the infections, but uh, I made it through. Uh, that was the worst, the cold and, and prevalence of, of illness. Everyone was coughing. It was like a pneumonia ward or something uh, throughout the whole uh, time. Um, I guess the hardest thing that I recall is also the physical nature of it. I was not physically uh, strong, particularly my upper body strength. I'd been away from any sort of decent exercise for some time. I was frankly quite soft. So uh, uh, regaining that strength, and I did regain that strength, uh, was quite a challenge. But uh, some seven or eight months later, when I completed officer candidate school, uh, there are pictures in my log, and I'm looking pretty good. So it was quite a transition from when I went in. So after basic training, you went to your OCS training? Yes. Uh, well, well, no. No. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I misspoke. I, when I enlisted, I, I, they would not guarantee me. They guaranteed me the opportunity to go to officer candidate school. They let me choose which officer candidate school I wanted to go to, but they didn't guarantee that. So my basic training and advanced individual training, uh, which are roughly three months each, uh, were at Fort Leonard Wood because that's the home of the Corps of Engineers and uh, the training center for them. So my basic training, uh, particularly my advanced individual training, was 
with respect to engineering, combat engineering, building bridges, building bunkers, uh, diffusing mines, laying mine fields, uh, making roads, and that sort of thing. So my anticipation was I would get some engineering background out of that service. So uh, I was at Fort Leonard Wood for six months in those two segments, basic training and advanced individual training. Then I went to Fort Sill because they, after a holdup of about 30 days, they uh, uh, changed my orders to go to into the artillery. They needed artillery officers more than they needed uh, engineering officers. And so I ended up at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, going through artillery officer candidate school. I did not know it at the time, but uh, of the four officer candidate schools, the artillery school is the hardest. It has the greatest fallout rate. Uh, the infantry is on the order of, at that time, the order of a third are not commissioned because they fall out or re are recycled. Uh, the um, armor is slightly higher, about 40%, uh, but the attrition rate, and, and engineering is about 45%, but the attrition rate in the artillery officer candidate school was over 50%. Less of my class of, uh, I think we started with uh, somewhere, uh, it's in my book, but somewhere around uh, 150, let's use round numbers, and, and about 70 were commissioned. Less than half uh, received their commission with their class. So it was pretty tough. Uh, do you recall your instructors? Uh, not by name, no. I recall some of them. Uh, probably the, I, I, actually I do. In basic training, the head drill instructor was uh, Sergeant Robeson. Uh, very, I'd say he was a, a beautiful, tall, black man. Uh, uh, he had a back like it had a steel ramrod up it. Uh, but uh, he was fair, but very firm. Uh, he had several assistants, uh, what they would call shake and bake sergeants who had done a tour in Vietnam, came back and decided to stay in and they were immediately made a sergeant, even if they were maybe a, a private or a corporal when they left. Uh, and they were in very good shape and they ran us and ran us and ran us because that's the best way of losing weight. So we ran everywhere. Uh, very little marching actually, mostly running. Um, so I remember uh, though that person, that personality, Sergeant Robeson, uh, in officer candidate school, I find it harder to remember individual and remember individual candidates with me in my class. But uh, in the supervisory role, uh, I don't remember any of them. I, I can see them. Uh, the toughest ones were the upperclassmen. They were. Uh, three grades, you were underclass, you were middle class and upper class, they had a red tab on their shoulder. They were the red birds, and they were the roughest on us. Uh, they really tried to break us, uh, and uh, uh, it was, I, at the time I didn't understand it. I understood physical exercise, I understood mental uh, from the standpoint of understanding your training and what you have to do, but here the objective was admittedly uh, to try to get, get you to fail, to try and get you to say, this is too much, I want out. Uh, it was mental harassment today. That is hard to even imagine uh, today. But it wasn't until I was in combat and I realized that the whole purpose was to give you so much harassment that you could still do your duties, still get your job done, uh, even though down inside you were terrified or or overcome with the surroundings. You could focus and get it done. And uh, I know of instances when I had to uh, call in artillery under fire with a radio antenna sticking up above my head. And uh, I was able to do it just coolly and clearly and accurately, which was the most important, because if you made a mistake and it landed in the wrong grid square, it could uh, cause serious injury to your own people, not necessarily the enemy. So it had a purpose, though I didn't understand it at the time. I thought it was just obscene harassment. And you were at OCS for how long? Uh, uh, let's see. About five months, I guess. 
Uh, I went in in October of 68 into BASIC and was commissioned the first week in August in 69. So that's uh, six, seven, eight, that's about nine months. So it was, no, it's about five months and two and a half months, two and a half months. So two and a half months in BASIC, two and a half months in advanced individual training, and the balance of that time was in Officer Candidate School. And after Officer Candidate School, did you get to choose what unit you went to, or was there a special mm -hmm. selection process? No, there was no choice. or, or uh, It was wherever the need was, and that continued throughout my whole service. Uh, uh, so I just received orders to go to uh, Fort Riley, Kansas, and uh, it was uh, an artillery uh, battalion of, uh, uh, some people would say they were tanks, they were self-propelled artillery pieces, and that's uh, uh, what my first assignment was. A very challenging assignment uh, for a number of reasons, uh, which I could enumerate, but it was, uh, it really, uh, showed that my training had done me well. So tell me about your first days when you checked in in Kansas. Well, I was married. Actually, I was married when I was, when I was drafted. Uh, so the, the difficulty was housing uh, initially. Uh, they didn't warn me about that. And uh, so first housing was uh, basically a motel. Uh, and we, uh, even though I was an officer, and it was probably two or three months in that motel before uh, I got on base housing, which was lovely. It was uh, terrific to be on base. Um, having my wife with me was wonderful, but uh, I, I pretty much worked six and sometimes seven days a week. Uh, the, uh, initially, I was assigned to uh, an artillery battery, which is a subunit of an artillery battalion. We had the responsibility for operations and maintenance of six self-propelled 155 howitzers, uh, and there's a lot of maintenance you know, mechanically there. Um, normally, an artillery battery has a uh, battery commander who's a captain, uh, several, uh, a battery executive officer who is usually a first lieutenant, so he has some time behind him, and then three platoon leaders uh, who are usually brand new second lieutenants, who are in the, in the field responsible for two of the guns and the sections in those guns, uh, or they may act as forward observers out on the firing range. In my case, uh, there were only two of us, the battery commander, who was a captain, and uh, myself, a brand new second lieutenant. Uh, it turns out, uh, unfortunately, that uh, my battery commander had just come back from a tour uh, with the Black Horse Regiment in uh, Vietnam. Uh, he clearly uh, suffered uh, from post-traumatic stress disorder. He, uh, I, I think it was pretty well known that he was an alcoholic as a result of that. And uh, so much of the operation of the whole battery was my responsibility, because he was often not available. Um, so I, I learned very quickly what became my motto, and that is uh, that I may be the officer, but I may not be the smartest or most knowledgeable person in my unit. And so I immediately went to the first sergeant, and I said, first sergeant, you know I'm brand new at, at this. You've been at it a long time. You've got white hair. Uh, you're stiff as a ramrod. Uh, you know that your way around here, so you're going to keep me uh, informed about what we have to do because you know how to do it and get it done. It'll be my responsibility. If it goes wrong, I'll be to blame, but I have to rely on you and we have to work as a team. And uh, that was my introduction to being an officer in the Army, actually, and uh, it worked out terrific. Uh, so I, I, I worked at the battery for about... Uh, six months, including field exercises where we went out and trained and, and uh, shot uh, our guns. Uh, 
it was it was very interesting in that, uh, as I said, normally there are close to half a dozen officers in an artillery battery. In my case, there was generally the battery commander wasn't there, and uh, it was me. And uh, if you can imagine, you're firing these guns that have miles of range, and if they're pointed in the wrong direction, it end up in the next town, not in the range uh, uh, where it's supposed to, not in the open. Uh, and normally, what's supposed to happen is that the battery commander is in the overall charge. You have a, a fire direction officer who is in uh, uh, M113 half track uh, sort of vehicle that has the plotting tables and all the electronic and uh, equipment and radios to uh, figure out once a fire mission comes in, plot it on the maps and figure out what the azimuth is, the height of the barrel, what the uh, direction is, what charge to run out on it, because uh, you may have, each artillery shell may have seven little bags of powder, let's say. Sometimes you're charged two, sometimes you're charged seven, if you want it to go a long way. Uh, uh, and you have to check and make sure there's a mountain in between that it's going to hit. Uh, so its trajectory will clear any intervening terrain. But my predicament was it was only me. Usually there's three or four officers checking everything from the, uh, the uh, fellow making the original computation to uh, the battery commander overall charge to the platoon leaders on every two guns to the battery executive officer who makes sure all six tubes are lined up in the same direction. Uh, well, it was only me. So on a typical fire mission, I'd get the mission in the fire direction center. I would oversee the plot and check to make sure it was correct uh, based on my map skills and, and trigonometry knowledge and uh, uh, certain charts that you would use, slide rules basically, because it was all manual. There was no computer at that time to uh, make the calculations. Then I would run outside and uh, they'd give the solution to the guns. I'd have to run down and make sure the proper uh, settings were on each of the six guns, and then I'd run through it all again as the safety officer who was supposed to be an independent, independent check, but I had to check myself, and then I'd stand back as the executive officer and say fire. So uh, the amount of responsibility was incredible, and the, the risk of doing something wrong and someone being injured uh, weighed very heavily on me. But it showed that my training had worked. I was able to work through that and still keep a straight uh, my mind in its right place. And uh, that went well for those five or six months. Well, um, the attrition in the artillery was particularly high uh, in Vietnam. And uh, it, the next thing I knew after only six months, as a, five months as a second lieutenant, uh, they reached down and tapped me and said, uh, we have a big exercise that we're going to be called to go to over in Germany next uh, uh, late summer, uh, early fall. And uh, <clears throat> our battalion uh, intelligence officer uh, is leaving. This is a captain slot. I'm still a second lieutenant. <clears throat> And they said, uh, we're going to transfer you and make you the intelligence officer. And I said, oh, okay. And they said, that's the good news. The bad news is we're having a <coughs> inspection, <coughs> excuse me, uh, by Fifth Army Headquarters, and all the records have to be correct. You have to make sure that, I didn't even know what the records were, that we have the right documentation, that if we have a document somewhere that says we have that document that has been checked in, who checks it out day-to-day -day basis if they need to look at it, uh, that's going to be your responsibility. <clears throat> so I uh, did what I always do. I went to uh, this, uh, the top uh, uh, commission, a non-commissioned officer who was a, uh, a first sergeant <clears throat> with six stripes, and uh, I said, top. You know I'm brand new, this is a new job to me, I haven't got a clue, but uh, we're going to get it done. You just have to fill me in and, and uh, we'll 
do whatever we have to do to get it done. And uh, by golly, uh, we passed that uh, CMMI, uh, uh, the highest score that they'd made in a long time. Not all due to me, but we had a wonderful battalion commander, Colonel Meifeld. <clears throat> and uh, so two or three months later, they said, uh, we're losing our special weapons officer who was responsible for all the nuclear records themselves and for all the training uh, for handling, because uh, the 155 is nuclear capable. In fact, its mission was designed uh, to go to Europe and plug the gap, what that's called the Fulda Gap in Germany, where the Russians might come pouring over the border. They, we still thought in those terms in the early 70s. Uh, and uh, that's what our reforger exercise was going to be in the fall. And uh, the special weapons officer was leaving, so I had to make sure that all the training was up to date, that all the vehicles uh, would meet uh, uh, the standards uh, for a nuclear inspection, and that special things like what you did if you're traveling in the United States or anywhere with your nuclear rounds in place, what you had to do to provide security, which was the main concern. So another new job, uh, now I'm nine months as a second lieutenant, and this is another captain's position, different one, but I, they didn't replace the intelligence officer, I just was doing both jobs, I did two captain's jobs, now I'm a second lieutenant doing the job of two captains. Well, by golly, we passed that, uh, the next inspection as well, and uh, I will say as a result, my battalion commander gave me a rank of uh, a rating on my individual efficiency report of 100, which is virtually unheard of anywhere in the military. And he was, uh, I had letters saying what an exceptional job I had done. I didn't know it at the time, I was just working my ass off. But uh, anyway, it all got done. Uh, unfortunately for me, now I've, I've been told in January that I, I was not going anywhere. I was staying with the 2nd and 7th Artillery because they needed me over in Germany. I had been trained to do all of this stuff with regard to uh, nuclear weapons and intelligence, and that was critical. And uh, my orders were going to be frozen. I was not going to leave the 2nd and 7th in Fort Sill. I was going to Germany. Well, I managed to, uh, with that exuberance and good news, uh, my wife and I uh, somehow managed to uh, have a pregnancy develop. Uh, and then uh, when she was six months pregnant, I got word that, well, we thought we could keep you, but we can't. They need you in Vietnam more. So I went to Vietnam uh, in spite of all the uh, protestations of my battery, my battalion commander, who's the lieutenant colonel, and division commander, who's a colonel, the Army said, no, we need him in Vietnam. So I left for Vietnam with my wife seven months pregnant, and that wasn't fun. So that, that was my stateside duty. So did you go to Vietnam with that same unit, or did you transfer to No, them? no, it was a different unit. The 2nd and the 7th was going. Their, their uh, assigned mission was to be ready to be transported. There were, they, we didn't have to transport the guns. They, were, they had guns over in Germany uh, that were mothballed. But the unit would go to, to Germany and then take over and go through this exercise, which was considered a very important Cold War exercise. Uh, so they were on a mission to do that, uh, but I was tasked to do something else and go to Vietnam. So when you transferred... Different unit. When you transferred to Vietnam, what was the, the travel like? Well, um, I had 30 days. Uh, not quite 30 days leave before I went to Vietnam. Uh, so I visited all my family. Uh, and uh, I had uh, 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 commercial flight status, but the money was very short. So my brother was in the Air Force. He had served in Vietnam in 65, 66, actually, and he was in, in uh, Dover Air Force Base. So I I said, uh, you think I could hop a ride on one of the C-130s to California and save some money rather than 
spend my allotment for an air ticket commercial, and then I'd fly commercial uh, to Vietnam. So it might not seem like a lot, but that was, that was a couple hundred dollars that my wife was able to keep rather than me spending on, on an airplane ride. And uh, so I, I flew in the back of a, of a C-130, noisy, wind blown through, but it was fine. Uh, I couldn't sleep, uh, not that I wanted to sleep. I, where I was going, I wasn't thinking about sleep. So it was, uh, it was fine. They, they took care of me. I got coffee. The crew chief uh, took care of me. And uh, it, my brother wasn't flying. It was another officer that flew the plane uh, in co-pilot. But they treated me very nice and dropped me off. And the next day I flew commercial. Uh, yeah, pretty much the next day I flew commercial via uh, Okinawa, I think. We stopped and then on to Tansanut in Vietnam. I forget what the plane was, but it was a commercial chartered flight, a cattle car, every seat filled, and uh, very, very quiet. What was your first impression upon landing in Vietnam? Well, everyone says, that I think, pretty much the same thing. Uh, we landed at Thompson New Air Force, Force Base at uh, Benoit, and there's a, a um, that's the center where all people entering in the army, entering Vietnam, are then assigned to various units. Uh, and what you remember is I got off the plane and the heat and humidity were enough to make you fall over. Just unless you've been there, you wouldn't think it could get that hot, especially on the tarmac where it's all paved. Uh, but the second thing you notice is this terrible, ugly smell. Uh, which turned out to be the ubiquitous smell of uh, burning uh, the waste from latrine because uh, there was no flush toilets or anything. It was just a, an outhouse. And uh, they mixed diesel fuel uh, into a, a cutoff petroleum barrel, and that's where the waste was. And that smell, from then on, for the next 11 months, it became a very common smell. Uh, but those are the two things I remember most. <clears throat> so you get off the plane, and then did you go to like a introductory? I, well, um, it, there were actually barracks there, uh, uh, pretty much the same in most of Vietnam at major uh, facilities at that time. Remember, this is '69, no '70. So it, uh, they had moved uh, a lot of units into more permanent installations. Because in 66, 67, and early 68, <clears throat> it was considered a temporary mission. No one expected we'd be there for as long as we were. So they, they had started building, actually, wooden structures. Uh, and so uh, there were barracks and mess halls and so on at the major bases. And they were typically a... Uh, what might be called a squad bay, would hold maybe a dozen people, uh, half walls, then screening, and uh, a sandbag roof. Uh, there were uh, wooden panels that flapped down over the uh, uh, screening. Uh, wouldn't stop anything. I don't know why they were there at all, but they were hinged panels. Uh, so uh, we were the, uh, we uh, and others who were uh, reporting in uh, would go to, into this center and uh, await our assignment. And they'd take all of our papers and take all of our, uh, uh, basically our personal things were locked up. They said, you won't need this anymore. Anything that we brought and uh, uh, we were given a receipt for it. And then... Uh, uh, we waited, and uh, I met uh, two people who I had graduated from officer candidate school with. Surprisingly, we weren't in the same unit in the States, but we all went over at the same time. We were all targeted at the same time. And so we had kind of a, a reunion, uh, probably drank more that night than we should have, knowing that it might be the last uh, that we drink for a while, and uh, took about three or four days before uh, I got my orders, and I was going to the Americal Division up in Eichauer, 
whose uh, main headquarters was in Chulai. And so in three or four days, uh, I got on a flight and flew to uh, Chulai, which is on the uh, ocean, uh, the uh, South China Sea, um, about two-thirds of the way up the coast. And did you fly there by helicopter or by airplane? No, that was, that was a, I think it was a twin-engined, uh, I forget what the designation is, but a twin-engine transport plane. And when you landed in uh, Chulai, you went to your your uh, artillery unit there? No. Uh, it's a series of reassignments. So I went from the central uh, overall army uh, reassignment basis. I was assigned to a division, which was the AmeriCal Division, uh, 26th Infantry Division, I guess. Uh, and... Uh, there, I again had to wait to see what unit I was going to go to within the AmeriCal Division. They also gave an orientation to Vietnam uh, uh, with uh, things like uh, malaria and uh, the various diseases that you might be susceptible to, uh, scorpions, leeches, all the little critters that would bother you poisonous snakes and enough to make you want to go home. Uh, I remember a demonstration on uh, using a repatriated or captured in uh, a Viet Cong who uh, were, they were telling about how they could sneak through a tangled mess of wire and still get through and you'd never know it. And uh, we're sitting in the bleachers facing this wire, and it's getting to be dusk, and the instructor, a sergeant, is telling us about these sappers who come in with a satchel charge and can throw it in the middle of your hooch, so you had to be very aware out at the perimeter, and uh, all of a sudden this Vietnamese in just a loincloth stands up, and no one had noticed him at all. He crawled underneath about, oh, 15 yards of tangled barbed wire and was able to get through without anyone even noticing him and pop up right in front of us. Uh, so it was a good example of what can happen. So there was probably about a week of training, and then I got my orders to the 30, 82nd Artillery at Hawk Hill, which is about an hour north of Chulai, uh, uh, near a little town called Tam Ki. And I'm, I, I thought that I might get a helicopter ride up there, but uh, we went up uh, uh, Route 1, QL1, and there I saw the aftermath of uh, some of the Tet activities, uh, bridges down, uh, the railroad, you could see the, the tangled rails had been blown up and interdicted by, by the enemy. Uh, uh, but the, I also got a first real look, because I had been on bases up until this point, driving up a road, and I was, at first I was saying, we're just me and this corporal or whatever is driving a jeep through civilian territory. What happens? Oh no, it's secure. They they would say uh, no problem. But uh, it gave me a chance to see the countryside and and the rice planting and women carrying loads of rice and and, and things that I couldn't carry uh, on, the, on a stick over their back with that they balanced uh, the churches and pagodas. Uh, so it was a very interesting trip. And then we uh, showed up at uh, Hawk Hill, uh, which was the headquarters of the 30 the 82nd Artillery. And that's where you stayed, or was there another battery that you went off to? No. Uh, normally, the assignment is you go immediately into the field as a forward observer with the infantry. Uh, and that, that role is probably the most challenging and dangerous that an artillery officer can pursue because you're embedded with an infantry unit. You have to be up in front to tell what's going on. Um, you've got radios all around you. And uh, in all of that, you have to call in the artillery accurately and on time. Um, but in my case, uh, it turned out that uh, the, the battalion commander saw my uh, records from the States, saw that, and he was one of the people who told me that it was 
almost impossible that I was gotten a, a 100 I, uh, uh, efficiency report. And therefore, he had a job for me. And I said, what's that? He said, well, this is a colonel, lieutenant colonel, uh, was the commander of uh, the 30, the 82nd Artillery. He said, uh, we have a, a inspection of, of all of our motorized equipment and uh, coming up in two months. And we've never passed one in the three years we've been in Vietnam. And uh, if I don't pass this one, I'll probably not going to go any further in my career. He said, so I'm going to make you a motor officer because uh, the motor officer in charge of the repair of all of our mechanized equipment, including the trucks that haul our guns, the guns themselves, make sure we have the right inventory of parts and all of that. And uh, so I'm going to make you motor officer. I said, motor officer? Where is that? He says, right here. You're going to be right here. So I said, hmm, I'm not going to be a forward observer. So he uh, turns me over to the warrant officer, who was uh, 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 also a, a commissioned officer, but not uh, not a, uh, uh, it's a different plane. Warrant officers are different from the re regular officer corps. And he was a very experienced chap. Um, so together, he and I, I w we started looking at the records, and they were completely all screwed up. There was no train of, of responsibility. Because the way to pass this is if you haven't got the part, you have to have a requisition in for the part. If you don't have a requisition in for the part, then you have to, uh, then you're going to, you're going to fail. So we went through, the first thing was go through all the paperwork and find out where our soft spots were. And also what the status was of every truck, every Jeep, every piece of, uh, every artillery piece. Uh, if they weren't in working order, why not? And what part did they need? And we probably spent the next month and a half writing requisitions, just paper, 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 paper. And uh, finally, uh, we got to the point where uh, it would also be negative if we were less than operational, which was, I forget what it is, but some percentage of the equipment had to be operational, and we weren't there, and there were certain parts that were missing. So I said, we've got the requisitions in, and the, the warrant officer said that, that they don't count. We're supposed to have a certain percentage of our equipment operational regardless, and, or else we've neglected to do it on time. So uh, he said, uh, we're going to have to break the rules. I said, what does that mean? He says, well, he took me out back and showed me that he had a big truck and it was full of parts, not necessarily the parts we needed. He said, we have to start an exercise of trading our parts for finding people who have the parts we need and we have something they need. I said, uh, why would they do that? Because they could get caught short. He said, well, we have a sweetener. And he took me to another truck and he had stockpiled several cases of Johnny Walker Black Label Scotch, which was the coin of the realm in the Army in Vietnam. And he said, uh, we'll sweeten the deal with some Johnny Walker Black, Blackjack. And uh, so I said, well, you've been around this longer than I have. Once again, I said, I, I'll be responsible, but uh, I've got to rely on what, what works because we're deep in a hole. And so we uh, bartered and begged and stole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we stole uh, stuff and uh, as did the best we could. And then we took our truck full of parts and put it on the road and said, don't come back for three days. And so that truck just drove down to Chulai, drove around, went everywhere but where it was supposed to be. And we wrote orders that it was supposed to be picking stuff up and so on. And so we had the command maintenance and material inspection. And by golly, we passed. And uh, my record was unbroken. I was able to do things people hadn't been able to do. And I'm not a good paperwork guy, but I guess I can get people to work for me pretty well. And uh, so uh, we passed the CCMI. Uh, and... Less than a week later, uh, oh, the other thing is, my wife gave birth 
uh, in, I should remember the date exactly, October 13th, I think it was, of, of uh, 70, of my son Bill. And uh, that was wonderful. And I even got to talk on the radio telephone to her, which is a, a joke in itself because you had to operate like a radio. So you're on the phone working through what they call the Mars system, which is volunteer system of phones and radio. And uh, But when you say, say, hello, dear, over. How are you, over? And you got to use it like you're using a radio. So uh, I did get to talk to her briefly. And less than a week later, I got orders that I was going to the field uh, as a forward observer. Not in one of the units that my, my uh, artillery battalion usually uh, supports, but rather I went down south to very near where Kali, where the massacre happened at uh, uh, Milai, uh, just a little bit west of there, uh, west of Quang Nai. And uh, it turns out that uh, I got, flew by helicopter first to uh, uh, Chu Lai, and then I was helicoptered out to Charlie Company, first of the 52nd Infantry. And it was the first of the 14th Artillery that was supporting them, not the 30th to the 82nd, so a different battalion. So I was totally unknown uh, and out of uh, my element, but I get flown, I, I get flown into Chu Lai, and uh, I'm told uh, there was a serious misadventure uh, with the headquarters of uh, Charlie 1st and 52nd, and you're needed as an emergency replacement for the forward observer, and that's all they told me. So I grabbed my bandolier of ammo and my little rucksack and water <coughs> and poncho and got on the next helicopter. Well, this had taken about 20 minutes to be told, hello, goodbye. I got in a helicopter and landed about half an hour ride on a little desolate hill uh, west of Quang Nai, and there isn't an officer to be seen. Uh, just a bunch of enlisted men sitting there, dejected. Uh, some had been crying. Uh, clearly, something had happened. <clears throat> and uh, so finally, uh, I think it was the first sergeant came in, who was checking the perimeter of this little barren hill. It wasn't a standard place to be, but it would happen to be open for helicopters. And uh, I said, uh, Top, what happened? He said, well, I wasn't here. I was in the rear, but uh, the uh, command unit tripped a large booby trap and it killed the company commander the third platoon leader, the chaplain, um, and uh, three or four enlisted men, and wounded seven others. Uh, and they're all gone. He said, uh, you're the new uh, forward observer, uh, and uh, there'll be a new, new uh, captain, uh, infantry command, uh, company commander, and a new third platoon leader and they should be in shortly. And so that was my introduction to the field. We, uh, they flew in and uh, the uh, captain and I had a brief inter, inter, uh, uh, interview and uh, he said, I hope you know who you're doing because this, we're both uh, uh, gonna be thrown into a, a difficult situation, not only uh, is it a bad area with a lot of booby traps, but the men, of course, uh, know they've had a terrible loss. And uh, we've got to try and pull them back together and get them as a working unit. And so about a half an hour later, we got on helicopters uh, and uh, flew a combat assault into the same area that they had been in, the third platoon, the remnants of the third platoon. Uh, and. Uh, I spent the next about a month and a half as a as a forward observer with that infantry unit, and uh, it seemed like every day 
one somebody in that company was wounded or killed by a booby trap. The booby traps were everywhere. And what I came away from that is not be able to justify what Callie did when he uh, when he did what he did and his people did what they did, but understood the frustration of having an enemy that in the daytime it could be a kid on a water buffalo. And at night, he, when you uh, follows you all day long, and this literally happened to us, uh, a child on a water buffalo ostensibly selling us warm Cokes, but uh, disappeared at dusk. And the next morning, there were booby traps on the same trails that we came in on the night before, because the kid went home and told his parents or his uncle or his brother, and they slithered out in the dark and planted booby traps on every point of egress out of our night position, hoping to catch us. And uh, we never, rarely if ever, uh, had a face-to-face -face firefight with the enemy. It was all booby traps, booby traps, booby traps. So I can understand how frustrating that would be. So that was my first uh, real combat assignment as a forward observer. I did call in artillery once or twice, but generally, uh, the one time we really needed artillery, we were in contact. We had... Uh, caught a bunch of bad guys in a small ville of three or four huts, and uh, uh, we were pinned down, and so I called the, in a fire mission. Uh, we were taking fire right from the huts themselves, straw huts, and uh, uh, I was told to wait, and it turned out that the province chief denied our request for fire. They had, they could say that it was a populated area and we couldn't shoot. And it was populated, but they were all bad guys. And uh, But we weren't able to shoot, so finally they, we were pinned down. So the captain said, we have, you know, the only way we we're going to stop this is if we charge them. And so we just all got online and firing and charged into the middle of it. And I'll remember that to this day. That's the first time I'd ever had bullets whizzing by me and splashing at my feet, and the bad guys went out the back door, there were three of them, and we all shot at them, but they were so far away by the time uh, we, we uh, realized it that uh, I don't think we did anything. They just disappeared like wisps of smoke, as I say in one of the poems that I wrote. Um, so it went on like that. Um, we had two other probably interesting events while I was south of Quang Nai. We, went, we rode out two monsoons within a month. Uh, and I'll tell you, there's nothing like uh, being soaking wet, can't get dry, and it's 50 degrees. You'll never be any colder than that. Uh, we had uh, men with hypothermia, the only way to, to, and we couldn't get helicopters in because it was overcast and they couldn't fly in to pull them out. And the only way to keep them warm was to go body to body and keep them warm with your body heat. Uh, so that was, that was a difficult, oh, about two weeks. Uh, in one case, uh, in fact, right initially, it was pouring rain. The water's up pretty much to our knees, and we're told to get the high ground. The problem was all the high ground we knew was mined because they knew the enemy knew that you'd want to occupy the high ground, and so they put booby traps on the high ground. So uh, <coughs> we... Um, Came, we tried to get away from the villages and more out in the weeds, in the woods, away from the villages where there'd be less Viet Cong. But in doing so, uh, the waters kept rising, and we got to a place uh, where uh, there was a canal and there was no bridge. All there was was a, uh, a single rail from the railroad crossing. <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, my balance has never been the best. I've never exactly been an acrobat. And you add a full pack, and I had a 40-pound radio unit on my back. And uh, so we were supposed to go one at a time, and I knew the only way to keep my balance was to keep moving. So I waited until I had a, quite a space between me and the guy in front of me <clears throat> and started almost at a run across that single rail. Well, in the middle, he stops. And uh, I stopped abruptly and lost my balance and went over backwards. The water was about eight, 
to 10 feet deep. <clears throat> and uh, I did catch a good breath before I went under, but I'm being dragged downstream. And finally, I get rolled over, and uh, I didn't want to lose the radio, which was probably stupid. I probably should have left the radio go, but that was my lifeline. And uh, so I crawled, and uh, that, then my lungs were going to burst. I thought it, it, I said, I can't do this anymore, yet I can't get up because the radio was holding me down. And all of a sudden, I didn't know I had crawled to a fairly shallow spot, and they spotted me and uh, dragged me out of the water. <clears throat> but I very nearly drowned. I came as close as anybody ever wants to come to drowning. And I remember that quite clearly. That wasn't fun. And uh, so that, that's the way uh, we went uh, on like that for, uh, well, the better part of a month. And then I got orders that uh, I was going back to my unit. They found another replacement from... Uh, uh, the 1st and 14th artillery who could come in and be the forward observer, which would be more in the chain of command rather than me from outside of my normal unit. And uh, so I went back to uh, my command up at Hawk Hill. But uh, it was a tough month. And then when you went back to your regular command, did you fill the same spot you were in? No, no. Uh, they put me in a couple of places. Uh, uh, first, uh, let's see, when I first arrived, uh, I was told that uh, the monsoon was still lingering and there was a, uh, there was a uh, alpha battery of uh, 3082nd was supposed to be moving north <clears throat> to uh, up near the marine area of operations south of Hue. And uh, only two, there were six guns on a, on a hill uh, far to the west of, of Tam Key or Hawk Hill. And uh, two guns had gotten out and then they got socked in again, but the infantry needed those guns. And so they said, we want you to be a platoon leader and take those guns on a road march up to this Korean Marine base where they uh, will provide firing support <clears throat> for uh, the American units and the uh, Korean units that are, are conducting this operation until the rest of the guns can come off where they're socked in. So again, I'd never done a road march in enemy territory and it had to be figured to be enemy territory. So the first sergeant is usually in the rear. He wasn't usually out on, on the forward fire bases. So I sought out the first sergeant uh, for uh, Alpha Battery, and I said, Top, uh, you've done this before. I have not. Uh, you need to tell me what we need to do. I, I knew the basics. I'd done it in training, but uh, and, and with uh, road march in, uh, in the States to go out to the field, and I knew about the spacing of vehicles and so on and so forth, but not under real terms when we needed, really needed security. So he said, that's all right. He said, that's fine. Uh, here's what we're going to do. And so uh, I reviewed that and I said, okay, that sounds good. Uh, I'm good at reading maps. So I'll go fo forward because the last person we want to lose is you because <laughs> you know what you're doing. And uh, so I took the Jeep and led the way and led the column uh, uh, through some pretty bad roads, but we got to the uh, uh, Rock Marine Base. Uh, we had to ford one stream with our vehicles that at first I thought, this isn't very good. This is, uh, it was, but uh, then we got the idea uh, to put a rope across as a guide. And uh, I and one of the enlisted men together held each other up until we get across and tie a rope. So that was, we knew that was, if we kept our left fender on that, it was still, that was the edge of the road. So uh, we brought the vehicles across, we had across and got to the Marine base. And uh, that was another experience. I don't want to digress too much, but uh, the Korean Marines are a rough bunch. Uh, and as, a, in, in, as an example of that, 
I spent about a week there. And uh, we um, put that back on. Spent about a week there, and uh, they were very disciplined. And um, we shot fire missions. Out of that, uh, I had a, a sergeant who, and I checked the the, uh, the firing solutions, and then checked the guns. But there were only two guns, so that was easy. But while I was there, this was a this was a encampment with watchtowers at four corners. And at night, the Koreans would uh, climb up uh, in there, and their, their drill was all night long. They would go on rotating basis around the yelling uh, things that were, I don't want recorded, but not nice, let's say, calling the Viet Cong very nasty names. And uh, daring them to come and attack, and that went on all night long uh, in a circular fashion from watchtower to watchtower. Well, somewhere around two o'clock in the morning, one of the watchtowers didn't respond and was silent. And the next morning, the uh, Korean Marine who had been in that watchtower, Marines, there were two of them. They both fell asleep, and. Uh, all the other Marines in the, their encampment turned out with bamboo batons and made a gauntlet just like you'd see in the old Indian movies. And these two guys had to run the gauntlet between their comrades. By the time they got through that gauntlet, they had just blood running down their backs. They were just beaten to a pulp, uh, literally, uh, on their backs. And that, they, they were, the Korean Marines were tough. They wouldn't tolerate any slackers. So that was a short assignment. That was about a week uh, as a platoon officer for two guns. I got back to uh, uh, 3082nd, and they uh, they said, "Well, um, our our uh, ammunition officer just uh, uh, left. Uh, went back to the states. We need someone to." coordinate the resupply to all of our fire bases uh, and the ammunition comes in by C-123 Air Force plane, roll it off the, the back and you've got, a, you've got two or three guys down there, you've got to break it down into sling loads, uh, a Chinook helicopter will come along and hook it out to the fire bases so that they will have their ammunition. And they're all low because uh, the monsoon just got over, we weren't able to fly ammunition out so it's going to be busy for the next couple of weeks. So it was critical. And so, again, I had another temporary assignment. This was getting to be nutsy, but uh, maybe saved my life. So uh, I went down to uh, a large base, large army base uh, called Tin Phuc, P-H-O-C-K, or C-H, uh, which had eight inch guns and 175 guns and uh, the supply for our uh, one, 105s. And so there was, turns out there were two, and it was dusty and awful, but uh, so there were only two guys, so I had to help them just like I was an, an enlisted man, uh, lugging the crates and breaking out the, the pallets when the, when the C-123s rolled them off and figure out how many rounds went to what unit and mark that and then climb up, the, up on top of the pallet and uh, the Chinook or the Sky Crane in some cases would come in if it was a heavy load and drop drop a hook down and we'd hook it on our net and they'd haul the net and take it off to the fire base. So um, that was interesting uh, work. Once again, it was more management than labor. Uh, but uh, there was no sleep because the 8-inch and 175s fired all night long. And... Uh, they would literally, the blast sometimes, if in the right direction, you'd be bounced right out of bed. Uh, so I did that for about a week and a half, two weeks. And then I got a call to come back to Hawk Hill. So I flew out to Hawk Hill again. And uh, it turned out that uh, my new job was, I was... I was now a first lieutenant because I was promoted just before I left uh, the States. 
<clears throat> after a year. But I was put in a, what's called a, cap, a, a captain slot, which is the artillery liaison officer to an infantry battalion. And uh, so I had the responsibility for all the forward observers who were assigned to that battalion, but also coordinating all the fires, all the clearances. So if there's helicopters flying in the area, I had to warn them. Uh, if there's other aircraft, uh, I had to do the uh, <clears throat> get the approvals from province chiefs that I was turned down uh, because uh, in the, the farther south. But now I was further north, and it, the, it was really a lot of action going on. So I spent the next five or six months as the artillery liaison officer with an infantry battalion. And in that time, we did uh, about a half a dozen combat assaults where I coordinated all the firepower, both artillery from two or three batteries of different guns, the uh, helicopter gunships, <clears throat> and the fast movers, the uh, phantoms and crusaders who drop bombs and napalm. And I coordinated all of that for the battalion uh, in all of our combat assaults. And also we built three different fire bases from scratch, um, cleared the hillside and put up wire and then did operations for maybe a month or two and then broke that down and uh, went somewhere else. So it was constantly moving uh, with different operations. And that, that was really how I wrapped up my tour, doing that for the last five or six months. So going back while you were there, you said you were um, in charge of that inspection and then you went to the uh, Ford Observer and things like that. Yeah. While you, you were doing all this, what was the, uh, the supply, was there any issues getting supplies and things like that? Um, in the monsoon period, there were, because uh, the helicopters couldn't fly. So that was a, a bad spate there for about two weeks. Uh, but generally, supply was very good in the field. Uh, uh, we'd get, uh, you could only carry so much sea rations. So at least once a week, we'd get resupplied, which was a nice event. Uh, um, but what I found was towards the end, there was, uh, in, in 71, we were starting to cut back on units. Um, and at that same time, we were up on the DMZ. We had gone up uh, there in support of Lam Sam 719, which was when the Vietnamese soldiers went into Cambodia. And we were, uh, our unit uh, was providing road security for QL9 all the way out to the border, right past Khe San. And uh, so uh, um, that was a quite a hectic exercise. Um, in, before we went out to Khe San, we we're, were on a hill near Khe San, we were at uh, Alpha 2, which was north, the northernmost military outpost on the DMZ. Uh, but over towards the ocean uh, on the, on, in the uh, east. And on one occasion, uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm getting to this supply thing, <clears throat> on one occasion, a helicopter came in, called an OH-6 Loach, and uh, <clears throat> they asked if uh, I wanted to go out and do some uh, airborne observation over the DMZ. To, pr to plan harassment and interdiction fires because um, the enemy, we knew that they were out in the DMZ. They were called the H&Is. And, I's. <clears throat> and I said, uh, well, uh, I loved flying helicopters, but we just got from our battalion S2 a notice that the enemy uh, had just employed Strela shoulder-fired anti-aircraft missiles in the DMZ and advised not to fly. Uh, and so I chose, I don't think I, I, I see no reason to do that. I don't see the benefit of it. And uh, uh, given that advisory, I don't think I want to go. So the uh, 
Infantry Battalion S3, also liked to fly. And uh, he was a captain, a West Pointer. He said, well, I'll take the ride. If, they, if, they, if the pilot wants to go, I'll go. So the pilot and uh, his gunner uh, and uh, the S3 took off. And not five minutes later, they were shot down in the DMZ. <clears throat> and uh, we had radio contact with them. And so we sent, we called uh, our ready reaction force, called the Blue Unit. We were attached to the 101st Infantry at that point, not our regular, not the AmeriCal Division. <clears throat> and so the Blues went in and uh, to rescue them. And we had the coordinates because we were on the radio with, with the people that were down. But it turned out the whole area was mined. And the Blues jumped out and took two or three casualties right away. So they were under strength to do any, go any further. So the helicopter immediately pulled them out. Well, the ceiling was bad to start with, and all of a sudden it just dropped, and there was zero visibility, and we couldn't get back in to where the chopper was downed. <clears throat> and so we were still in radio communication. So the battalion commander, the infantry battalion commander, I hope this isn't too confusing, came to me and said, uh, can you do anything? I said, well, we can't get in with, the only thing I could do is fire artillery in a box around it and try and keep the enemy's head down long enough for us to get in tomorrow. <clears throat> and so I got on the radio and just said, any, any unit on this net, any unit on this net, uh, fire mission, gave them the coordinates of a box. I gave them several coordinates. I advised them that uh, friendlies are in the center, uh, so be careful of your, uh, not the words I used, but uh, of your uh, firing solutions, and uh, give me as much support as you could. And it turns out, by the time I was done, I had the Navy firing for me, I had the Marines firing for me, I had a couple of uh, Army artillery units, heavy guns, 8-inch, 175s, <clears throat> um, and so uh, I gave them on a rotating basis. I said, try and put it around, oh, every five or 10 minutes from your guns in a rotating basis. And they did all night long. But sometime during the night, we lost communication with uh, the people on the ground that were downed, one of which uh, had, had uh, an injury, probably an accident injury. And the next morning we went in and they were gone. They had been captured. Um, what we found out was the, uh, the NVA had tunnels all over the area and they probably had a tunnel right under where the helicopter went down and snatched them as soon as it was dark. That's probably my phone. Uh, can we stop? So the, um, we weren't able to get them out. They were uh, apparently captured. We had no contact. So a couple of days went by, and my uh, the infantry battalion commander, uh, no, it was the next day, the infantry battalion commander, who I had a very good relationship with, came, came in, and uh, no, he was, he was away, that's right. And I got a call that I had to report to 101st headquarters, division headquarters, and they sent a helicopter, and it was urgent. So, helicopter shows up, because they're now our parent unit temporarily. Um, helicopter shows up, I get on board, take me to the 101st, I'm ushered into uh, the supply officer for the division. And he said, uh, you Lieutenant Henningsen? Yes. Uh, are you the one who authorized all this firing uh, the night before last? I said, yes. He said, uh, did, who, who authorized you to fire all that? I said, well, my battalion commander asked me, my infantry battalion commander, he said, no, 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 you're operating for the 101st. Who cleared all that fire from the 101st? I said, I just talked to the batteries directly. It was an emergency situation. He said, well, you shot up our entire artillery authorization for the whole month in one night, you're in big trouble. I am going to 
request that you be brought up on charges for misappropriation of, of uh, uh, military property uh, in excess of a million dollars. I said, you've got to be kidding. He says, I don't kid. He said, you'll hear, go back to your unit, and I don't remember exactly, you'll hear from us. So I get in a helicopter and fly back out to Alpha 2, where I was, and uh, the battalion commander comes in. He had been out the infantry, but my direct commander from the 2nd and 1st Infantry came in and said, uh, why do you look so glum? And I told him what happened, and he yells out the door, hold my helicopter. He says, you're coming with me. So we get on the helicopter. I says, where are we going? He says, we're going down to Chulai. We're going to talk to the AmeriCal division commander. So we fly to Chulai, which is about an hour ride, and uh, land, go into barges, is unannounced, barges into the division commander's office, or, or set of offices. You wait here. And uh, barges into the S-4, who was a lieutenant colonel for, for the AmeriCal division. Tells them what happened. Tells them how blessed stupid it was that uh, they didn't care about the his men shot down in the DMZ, uh, and they better talk to the 101st and get them straight. So something went on there. I hear a lot of yelling, a lot of yelling in there, and uh, finally he comes out. Come on, let's go. And we come back. In my helicopter, it was too noisy to talk. And uh, we landed up at Alpha 2, up in the DMZ. And he, I said, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, what happened? He says, it's over. Forget about it. And, he, and apparently the AmeriCal gave, told the 101st, they better realize that he's a soldier first and a, and a, a warehouseman second and figure it out. And uh, so that went away. So that was... I thought I was going to be court-martialed for sure, and that's what I was threatened with. But anyway, that went away. And as far as the stress goes, because that must have been a really stressful situation to be in. It was. Um, compared to when you were filling all those jobs of different officers or the position of a captain, uh, how did you deal with the stress of that, also with the stress of being a uh, board observer? Well... Well, I, uh, I go back to my training. I just didn't think about it. I just somehow was able to blot, to just say, uh, okay, I got to move on. Just that they, and that was in officer candidate school and actually throughout my tri training, they, they think what you were told is drive on, drive on, uh, which isn't always the best thing in life, but in a combat situation, you have no, that's what you have to do. You just have to drive on. You don't have any alternatives. Uh, you can't hide. You can't run away. So, uh, though I, I uh, that, was, that was probably, uh, up until then, I, I did consider staying in the military. Uh, my, with the officer efficiency reports I had back in the States, uh, I knew I was doing a great job uh, as a forward observer and as an LNO and the motor officer passing their tests for the first time. Uh, I knew, and I was told, I was excellent material. But that this business with the 101st and the and it's, and the our, the uh, supply, and of course he was desperate. Uh, the point was, supply was getting to be a problem. We were cutting back. And as we cut back, the supplies would cut back in the same fashion. And so things had been relatively quiet, and now all of a sudden uh, uh, I used all this ammunition. It caused a logistical problem, but uh, I didn't care. It, 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 to me, it, it shouldn't have been a concern, but it was. It was paper instead of lives, and I couldn't. I said, I don't like that. So that, a good question on your part. It's probably the first time that I said, this really sucks. Uh, that that here I was doing that to try and save somebody, and and uh, I get threatened with charges. So that was that was the first 
time, I said, you know, I don't think I'm, I'm this, that kind of uh, ramrod straight by the book, you can't always go by the book. And uh, I don't think, uh, I might not do well in the Army, especially uh, down the road at a, at a higher level. And that was compounded uh, about three weeks later. We went from Alpha 2 on the, up on the eastern DMZ out to Quezon. And we, uh, we relocated to a hill. Um, and, and not the, the whole unit was around us. We were uh, dispersed to provide road security along QL9, which was the main supply route to all of, to the, to the uh, uh, South Vietnamese forces in Cambodia. And, our, and they, they were ambushed frequently along that road. It, it, the road had been reopened to Quezon. So we're on this hill, and there's uh, the, the battalion commander who I had a good relationship with had gone on R&R. &R. Uh, he, he deserved it, and... and was off to the States. And there was a major who who uh, was in charge. And he, we're on this little hill, and there couldn't have been more than 30 of us, which is a pretty small force when you're that deep in Indian country. And we put out perimeter wire, and we had uh, the heavy mortars, 4.2-inch mortars on the hill. And my radio team and the battalion, infantry battalion radio team, but there weren't more than two dozen, I would think, of us on this little hill in the middle of bad guys all around us. Well, we had cleared part of the hill and had the wire out, but we didn't have any formal bunkers or anything. We were, and so the, this major temporary battalion commander who was going by the book said, the brush is too close to us. Uh, we've got to get the brush back away from the wire, they could crawl up onto us. And that's, that was true, but um, we didn't have any of the tools necessary to cut and, and dig out the brush. And uh, I, So he said, uh, we're going to burn it off. And it was, it was 110. I know that because I checked. Uh, we had a few containers of water, but we didn't have a big one of the, 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 sometimes in a base you have a big blivet that's half the size of this room full of water. A helicopter brings them. We didn't have that. We just had little water bags. We didn't know when we'd be resupplied because the first people being resupplied were those out in Cambodia and, and, and at Quezon. And I said, sir, uh, I don't think that's a good idea. We haven't got the tools to fight a fire and contain it. And it's very, very dry. This brush is very dry. If it gets out of control, uh, we got no place to go. He says, I'm ordering you, because I was the only other officer on the hill. He's a major, I'm a lieutenant. He said, I'm ordering you to get the men to burn off the brush. And I said, sir, I told him, sir, respectively, I decline. I will not. I, uh, I do not think that that's a safe thing to do. He said, you're, defined, you're, you're challenging my order. I said, I'm not challenging. I'm, I'm advising you that it's not a good thing to do, and I, I am not going to have my men do it. Because he wanted my artillery uh, crew to be involved as well. He said, well, you're disobeying a direct order. I'll have you court-martialed for that under combat conditions. He said, if you don't end up in Leavenworth, you'll be very lucky. He said, go, to your, go into your hole in the ground, and I don't want to see you. And he turned around to his men and his, the infantry men, and he said, uh, uh, he turned around to my first, to my, my uh, sergeant, and said, because he was the next, there weren't any other, there were corporals and privates, but he was the next in, uh, in, in, in rank. And my sergeant refused to do it. So he put all of us under, under the ground and said, don't come out until I tell you, you can come out, and told his, the junior, uh, privates and corporals to start the fire. Well, not 10 minutes went by, and I hear screams outside, and uh, the fire had caused an updraft, and uh, just came up, the, the fire came up the hill and was into the wire, and uh, the 
uh, mortar rounds were stacked and the fi fire was licking against the wooden cases uh, of the mortar rounds and uh, everybody's screaming and I and uh, bless his heart my recon sergeant uh, said we can't lieutenant we can't let this happen and I says you're damn right we can't and he ran out first I said you get you you uh, start trying to get the men take their shirts off whatever break down some of the cake first thing throw the the mortar shells out in the center because it was an open area in the center and the mortars were kind of right around the perimeter because we were using both for where the mortars were but also as our firing bunkers if we were attacked. So we threw the shells in the, in the center. Um, they weren't fused so it was okay. And uh, some guys would do that and, and then we take the broken down cases, slats, and beat out the fire with that. And uh, uh, in our clothes and uh, to beat out the fire and we were able to to stop the fire after about 25 minutes and to get it away from the perimeter anyway. We beat, beat it down enough that it it uh, wasn't a risk anymore. Meanwhile the Major was nowhere to be seen. He had gone underground himself thinking that as everyone else the whole top of the hill was going to blow off when the rounds got burned. So uh, he, he uh, I'm, I'm trying to take care of it on the radio. Uh, we had a couple of people burned, but they weren't burned seriously. Uh, so I, I think we got a medic from one of the units to come and bandage. We didn't have a medic with us to bandage him up. Um, and th later they flew out. But uh, finally the major comes, comes out and we walked the perimeter uh, and set up again to because we had torn everything down, set up again to uh, protect ourselves. And he never mentioned anything, never mentioned the fire, never mentioned anything. He basically let me tell people what to do to get us squared away again. So um, the battalion commander came back and I didn't say anything. I figured that somebody would tell him, but I didn't say anything to the battalion commander. He came back from R&R &R, and the major went to the rear and there was never any discussion about that I was going to be court-martialed for refusing an order or anything. So I finally, I, I, uh, we pulled back from the DMZ and Quezon and went back to our main unit. And uh, I uh, went to the uh, S1, the administ administrative officer for the 2nd and the 1st Infantry, and I said, I would like to put in, since we weren't being actually shot at, uh, I couldn't get some other heroism met, although this sergeant really deserved it because he led the, clean, the putting the fire on. I put him in for what's called the soldier's medal, which is heroic saving of others' lives uh, under difficult conditions, not under fire. Could happen in peacetime for that matter. I put him in and... and uh, Got the paperwork, walked into the major, and uh, without knocking, and uh, said, "You're going to sign this, and if you sign it, I'll keep my mouth shut. Otherwise, we'll both be in deep doo doo." And uh, he sneered at me, signed it, didn't say a word, handed it back to me. And I brought it back to the S1 and uh, had the soldier's medal awarded for my sergeant. But we, it was never talked about, ever. And I said, this shouldn't be. Someone should talk about this. Something, something should have happened here. This, this major used very bad judgment uh, to start with and then to, to try and reprimand those who were doing the right thing. This is crazy. And that's when I decided this isn't an army I wanted to be part of. So while you were staying busy in Vietnam, uh, you mentioned your battalion XO had gone on R&R? Did you ever take an R&R &R or a leave or anything like yes, that? Yes, I did. Uh, uh, I did. Uh, and it, it was difficult, I found. Uh, my wife met me in, in Hawaii. Uh, at, at, we both decided it, it wasn't appropriate to bring uh, um, 
see, it would have been about a three-month-old baby that wouldn't have added anything to the party. But it was very difficult for me. I, I, uh, I just, I didn't, well, at first, and it was awkward. I didn't feel, I was in another world. My head was still over there, yet I, as became my habit, I, I didn't want to talk about it uh, to my wife. Uh, I never wrote anything about it when I wrote letters. I, was, I always tried to be upbeat and talk about positive, positive things in my letters. So I think we, was, we enjoyed each other's company and that I was alive and we were together. But it was only, by the time you fly to Hawaii and fly back, it's only three or four days together. And we spent most of the time touring the island and going to good restaurants and eating decent food. Uh, but it was over all too soon. Uh, but it was good to get away from it, but I knew I was going back. So when you said you were at that point in your service, uh, you didn't want to stay in the military. And was that right about the time that you left Vietnam? Or? No, that was, that was uh, let's see. I left in the middle of May of 71. And uh, I, had a, uh, I came back from the DMZ with the same unit. And we had a relatively soft uh, assignment. Uh, up near the Rock Marine Base, in the same area, uh, there were we had some some contact with the enemy. Uh, one lo very large fire mission during the night, which clearly I could see uh, killed scores uh, of bad guys. Although they cleaned the bodies off before the next morning, so. But I could see him flying in the air. I knew that. I, we had a starlight scope, so I could see what was going on. Uh, but in terms of one-on-one -on -one types of interaction, uh, it was pretty soft. It, it was hot and uncomfortable, but safe, relatively safe. Uh, so that was a, about a month and a half before I left uh, Vietnam. But in the interim, while I was up on the DMZ and before this fire inc incident, I was reading the Stars and Stripes. That, and uh, it said in there that the e US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, had just been created. And the National Environmental Policy Act had been passed the, the previous year. And as a result, uh, construction of projects was having a difficult time because the engineers were designing stuff as they always did and the environmental people is, were saying you can't do it that way you, you're crossing a river and you're not making any protection that you're going to cause erosion this was in, in the 70s and I said you know I've got a biology degree I used to teach biology if I get left here and got an engineering degree and learned more about that I might be able to deal with this impasse between the environmentalists and the engineers and allow things to get done, but in the right way. And so I put in, I put in an application to go to graduate school, and, uh, and, and I knew I'd, at that point I was going to get out, but I wanted to get an engineering degree and see if I could do something in environmental engineering. And so I found out uh, after I left the DMZ, uh, I got in my mail uh, a an acceptance to school, and b a granting for an early out to go to grad school because they were winding down, pulling people out of Vietnam, and so I actually left about a month or two earlier than I should have. I only served ten months in Vietnam, only it seems like a forever, but uh, and so uh, I was able to get out early and. And get the GI Bill and get tuition paid by the EPA to go to school and get my engineering degree and that was a whole new life that for me and that, so uh, the end was very positive uh, leaving. So you left you had left Vietnam and you went where directly to graduate school. In, so you uh, separated from the service in Vietnam. Yes, I did. 
And can you tell well, me actually, you? formally, it would have been in Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh, can you tell me what your homecoming was like coming back to the United States from Vietnam? Um, well, I knew what it was, what it would be like if I showed up in uniform because I, on the streets of Manhattan, Kansas, when I was officer of the day, uh, I would go in in a jeep looking for enlisted men who were who had uh, been out on pass and uh, would get into trouble if they drank too much. And it was my job as officer of the day to go out at midnight on weekends and uh, sometimes, about once a month, and, and look for enlisted men in trouble and get them in the jeep and get them from being, prevent them from being arrested by the civilian forces. And in that process, I had to go to by Manhattan College, Manhattan University, I guess it is, that's in uh, uh, eastern Kansas, uh, near Kansas City. Anyway, I, I would do this regularly on a schedule, and the, the, the students would know I was coming, because they knew Saturday night is when the OD comes down to pull people out of the bars. And they were all prepared, and they had signs that said, hey, hey, what do you say? How many kids did you kill today? And they throw garbage on me, eggs, and at the Jeep. And so I knew what the spirit was. I'd read about Kent State. Um, and uh, I didn't expect that it would be a very good homecoming. So when I got to Fort Lewis, Washington, I threw everything that was military away and put on civilian clothes and just traveled. I didn't, didn't talk to anybody about where I'd been or whatever. And that went on for 30 years before I talked to anybody about it. And then when uh, you left... Washington, you, did you go back to see your wife? And yeah, that's when I went home, saw my wife, and, and within two weeks I was in grad school. And when you went to grad school, did you use a GI Bill to pay for yeah, that? Yeah, GI Bill paid for it. And then uh, after you finished grad school, what did you end up doing? I became an environmental engineer and uh, worked on everything from closing landfills to building sewage treatment plants to building water plants. Um, uh, and cleaning up hazardous waste sites. Uh, I had a wonderful did 30 you, years. Did you keep in touch with anybody from your service? Um, no. No did you, one. Did you join any uh, veterans no. organizations no. or anything like no. that? No. I didn't want anything to do with it at that time. It wasn't until I retired that I realized that uh, I had been extremely lucky. Uh, both where I'd been, what I'd done, when I'd done it, uh, and came back relatively unscarred, uh, although it, I certainly remembered a lot. Uh, and that's when I decided that I was going to, that uh, I wanted to do volunteer work, and I started looking for volunteer work uh, to help other veterans. Can you tell me about your volunteer work that you do now? Yes. Um, there is a program at the West Haven VA called uh, Giant Steps. And I, 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 once again, I was fortunate. I went to the VA and found out they did have volunteers, but most of them really help people find their way around the VA or push wheelchairs or whatever. But I really wanted to work with people. I'd done enough reading and knew what was in my own head, that I, I wanted to work with a program that helped those who were having trouble re-entering society that had uh, suffered from PTSD and, and similar uh, uh, difficulties. And I found that there was a, a therapy program at the West Haven VA, and more importantly, uh, there was a program that used the arts as therapy and group, group therapy. And so uh, uh, I interviewed and talked to uh, the, the woman who was then in charge of that program, and uh, she liked my enthusiasm, I guess. And she said, well, really what we need is somebody to help with the gardening program. And it's not my favorite thing, but it'd be working with other vets, and uh, they, they get gratification out of planting stuff and seeing it grow. And so I said, well, okay. And so that's what I started, lugging bags of peat and stuff and showing them what to do and uh, how to plant. Uh, and uh, 
But then I started working more with the arts group after the first year. Uh, that's when I started writing and painting, and I've been doing that now for, I'm in my fourth year, I guess. And, uh, and I've done other, uh, with other volunteer groups, but uh, recently I have started talking to people from the American Legion and uh, the Vietnam veterans, uh, not the Vietnam veterans of America, but the uh, VFW. And uh, there's a lot of good work that could be done there, but first we have to overcome, there's a cliquishness that's there, and, uh, it, and, they, and nationally they're aware of it, but the local posts uh, in the VFW are really just places, dark places where people smoke and drink. And they're not, and of course alcohol in a lot of cases is the last thing they need to, to get out of their situation, but that's what they go there for. And the American Legion are viewed by the VFW as second-class citizens because they aren't necessarily, have never been in combat. And so what I found is most of the American Legion are uh, World War II vets or Korea vets, and the younger Vietnam vets are usually members, it seems. Who have, uh, and uh, so that was disappointing. But I'm still searching for a way of bringing the two of them together. I think they, they need all the help, uh, veterans need all the help they can get. And, and if those organizations could be more effective, at least from what I see locally, it would make a big difference. So I do work with them now trying to change what's been going on in my local area. And how did your service affect the way that you lived the rest of your life? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I, I, if I may, I, uh, this is a book that I, I, I wrote of poetry and, and uh, some of the art that I've done while working with other veterans. But what happened was, when I was up on the DMZ, uh, I had um, the fellow who was shot down on the DMZ and was a POW for three years had become a, a, a good, as, friend, as good a friend as you could have in the military in combat. You don't have many friends, but we were relatively close. And uh, he was shot down and I didn't know what happened to him. Well, I did after he was released. Um, I had a, a another lieutenant when I was with the, uh, down near Quang Nai who uh, was uh, severely wounded with a bouncy petty mine, a booby trap, a very bad chest wound. He survived. And a third lieutenant who was the head of a reconnaissance unit with the second or the first, um, wonderful young man uh, was shot in the head and killed. Uh, so the only three junior officers I had been close to in Vietnam had either been wounded or captured or killed. And I fully expected when I was up in the DMZ that my time was pretty much up. So uh, one of the poems I wrote is called Starry, Starry Night. And I, and I won't read the whole thing, but basically it, it recounts that I was sitting on a hill, and it was a very starry night. I was looking up at the sky, and I'm, I gave up organized religion when I was 12. I was disenchanted with uh, I, I, the two-facedness of it as I viewed it. But I said, uh, I really think my number is about to come up, but if there's anybody up there listening, I vow that if I get through this, I will um, spend the rest of my life, according to the Golden Rule, to uh, treat others as I would like to be treated myself and bend over backwards to do that. And uh, that's been my credo for the last uh, 40 years. And I think I live up to it pretty well. I, I did it all through my environmental engineering career, trying to make things better. For people, and seriously, and I sometimes I come up against people who didn't appreciate, and they say, "Well, you're working for the engineering company. You're supposed to make this happen." I said, "Well, I can make it happen, but you're going to have to change your plans to make it happen in a way that 
that is more thoughtful about how it affects other people. And uh, that's the sort of thing that I've tried to do ever since. Do you have anything else that I haven't covered in this interview that you'd like to go over? No. I, I, well, the only thing is, I come back to what I'm doing right now as a, as a volunteer at the VA. Um, I, I would like people to understand, or if there's any message I would like if someone hears this, is uh, how difficult it is. And I was very fortunate. I had strong family. I had uh, siblings. Um, I was able to go on and get a new career uh, as luck would have it. And I, everything fell into place for me. And not everyone is that lucky. And there are a lot of veterans out there who are struggling. And uh, it's not enough to say thank you for your service. Uh, I mean, it's nice. It's better than not saying anything or turning your back. But... Uh, I know when I to run into another vet that I don't know, and I, I, I say, welcome home, and how are you doing? And I mean it when I say, how are you doing? Because I think a lot of them are still struggling, and if there's anything that can be done, and it's got to be done by the civilian population. Right now we've got uh, uh, what, less than, in, in the uh, World War II and through most of Vietnam with the draft, Close to 10% of families had someone in the military close to them, a, a direct family or friend. Now we have maybe 1% of our families are affected by people in the military. Uh, and we've lost track of the obligation we have to those who are in the military, and they serve hard. Now, I can't imagine spending six months in Afghanistan, coming home to a family and trying to be normal, and then going back and killing people for six, six months. That's not easy. And uh, I don't think we recognize yet how big a burden that is. And uh, I think our civilian population has to do a better job understanding it. Well, I would like to say thank you for your service and also for coming in and sharing your story with us. My pleasure. Thank you very much.